The Dawn Flows Home to the Sea, Part 2, by Mikhail Sholokhov. This book consists of 688 pages and is divided into seven parts, subdivided into varying numbers of chapters. Our recorded Part 1 consists of Parts 1 through 3 of the printed version of the book. Our recorded Part 2 consists of Parts 4 through 7 of the printed version. Part 4, The Shadows Fall, Chapter 1. Fighting was going on around the approaches to the district center of ust Medvedica. Grigor first caught the muffled sound of gunfire as he turned off the summer track onto the Hetman's High Road. All along the high road, the traces of the Reds' hurried retreat were visible. He came across numerous abandoned two-wheeled carts and britskas. In a ravine beyond a hamlet stood a gun with its axle shattered by a shell and with its barrel twisted. The traces to the single trees of the limber had been slashed obliquely. Half a mile from the ravine in salt marshes, on stunted, sunburnt grass, Soldiers' bodies in khaki shirts and trousers, with putties and heavy iron-shod boots, were lying in swaths. They were Red Army men who had been overtaken and sabred by the Cossack cavalry. As Grigor rode past, he could easily tell this from the blood dried copiously on the shriveled shirts and by the position of the bodies. They lay like scythed grass. The Cossacks had not stripped their clothing off them, probably because they had continued the pursuit. A Cossack was lying close to a bush of hawthorn. The red stripes showed rustily on his wide-flung legs. A little way off lay a light bay horse saddled with an ancient type of saddle, the pommels painted with ochre. Gregor's and Prokhor's horses were growing tired. It was time they had a feed, but Gregor did not feel like halting in a spot where a fight had recently taken place. He rode on nearly a mile farther, dropped down into a ravine, and halted his horse. A little way off he could see a pond with a dam washed away down to the foundations. Prochor rode towards the crumbling and cracking edges of the pond, but suddenly turned back. "'What's the matter?' Grigor asked. "'Ride closer and look.' Grigor rode his horse towards the dam. A dead woman was lying in the mud. Her face was covered with the lower edge of her blue skirt. Her full white legs, with sunburnt calves and dimpled at the knees, were straddled shamelessly and horribly. Her left arm was twisted behind her back. Gregor hurriedly dismounted, took off his cap, stooped, and pulled the dead woman's skirt down over her body. Her youthful, swarthy face was handsome even in death. Under her painfully knitted brows, the half-closed eyes gleamed faintly. In the grin of her softly outlined mouth, the clenched close teeth shone like mother-of-pearl. A fine strand of hair hung over the cheek pressed to the grass. And over this cheek, which death was already tinging with fugitive saffron-yellow shades, fussy ants were crawling. The beauty the sons of bitches have destroyed, Prochor said in an undertone, he was silent for a good minute. Then he spat fiercely. I'd put such, such clever scum against a wall. Let's go on, for Christ's sake. I can't stand looking at her. It makes my heart turn over. Don't you think we might bury her? Grigor asked. Why? Have we got to bury all the dead we come across? Prokhor objected. We buried some old gaffer at Yagodnoya, and now there's this woman... If we're going to bury them all, we shan't have enough calluses on our hands. And what are we going to dig a grave with? You can't do it with a saber, brother. The earth's baked hard with the heat for a good two feet down. He was in such a hurry to get away that he caught the toe of his boot in the stirrup. Once more they rode up the hill, and then Prochor, who had been concentratedly pondering over something, asked Grigor, What do you think, Pantulievich? Haven't we poured out enough blood on the earth? Pretty well. But what do you think? Will it be finished soon? It'll finish when they've smashed us. Well, it's a gay life we've run into, the devil be praised. Perhaps the sooner they smash us, the better. 
In the German war, a man would shoot off his own finger and they'd let him go home. But now you could tear all your hand off and they'd still make you serve. They take the halt, the maimed, the blind, they take the ruptured, they take all sorts of scum so long as they can toddle on their two legs. Is that the way to bring the war to an end? May they all be damned, Broker said in despair. And turning off the road, he dismounted, muttering something in an undertone, and began to loosen his horse's saddle girths. After nightfall, they arrived at a hamlet situated not far from Ust Midvyaditsa. A picket of the 3rd Regiment, posted on the outskirts of the village, held them up, but recognizing their divisional commander by his voice, the Cossacks reported that the divisional staff was situated in this very village, and that the chief of staff, Captain Kapilov, was expecting him any minute. The garrulous outpost commander detailed a Cossack to lead Grigor to the staff, and added as his final word, They've taken up very strong positions, Grigor Pantelievich, and I don't suppose we shall be taking Ust Medvedica for a long time. And then, of course, who knows? We've got sufficient troops, too. They say British troops are arriving from Morozovsky. Have you heard anything about it? No, Grigor answered as he touched up his horse. At the house occupied by the staff, the shutters were closed and fastened. Grigor thought there was nobody in the house, but as he went into the corridor, he heard muffled, excited talk. After the darkness outside, the light of the large lamp hanging from the ceiling of the best room blinded him. A thick and pungent smell of tobacco smoke tickled his nostrils. So here you are at last, Kopilov said in delight, appearing unexpectedly out of the blue cloud of smoke billowing above the table. We've been a long time waiting for you, brother. Grigor greeted everybody, took off his cap and greatcoat, and went to the table. You've smoked out the place. It's impossible to breathe. Open just one little window, he said, frowning. Khailampi Geramakov, who was sitting beside Kapilov, smiled and retorted, but our noses have got used to it, and we don't even notice it. Pushing out a window pane with his elbow, he flung open the shutter. The fresh night air burst into the room. The lamp flame flared up and went out. Well, there's good management for you. What did you push the pane out for? Kapilov asked discontentedly, rummaging over the table with his hands. Who's got any matches? Careful, there's a pot of ink right by the map. They lit the lamp covered the hole in the window, and Kapilov hurriedly began to explain. At the present moment, the situation at the front, Comrade Melyakov, is as follows. The Reds are holding Ust Medvedica, covering it on three sides with forces numbering approximately 4,000 bayonets. They have sufficient artillery and machine guns. They've dug trenches around the monastery and in several other places. They occupy the Donside Heights, and as for their positions, well, I won't say they're inaccessible, but they're decidedly difficult to take. On our side, in addition to the divisions commanded by General Fitzsheolarov and two officers' storm detachments, Bagatiriev's 6th Brigade and our 1st Division have arrived. But the division isn't up to its full strength. The infantry regiment is missing. It's still somewhere near ust -Hapiersk. But the cavalry have all arrived, though the squadrons are far from being up to full strength. For instance, in my regiment, the 3rd Squadron numbers only 38 Cossacks, said the commander of the 4th Regiment, Kornet Dudaryev. And how many were there originally, Yermakov asked? Ninety-one. Why did you allow the squadron to break up? What sort of commander do you call yourself, Grigor asked, frowning and drumming on the table. Well, who's going to hold them back? They scattered through the villages, rode off to see their folk, but they'll be dribbling back again soon. Three arrived today. Kapilov pushed the map across to Grigor. Pointing with his index finger, he showed the disposition of forces and went on. We haven't made any attack yet. The second regiment advanced on foot against this sector yesterday, but without success. With great losses... According to the regimental commander's report, yesterday he lost 26 men killed and wounded. Now for the relative state of the forces. We've got the numerical superiority, but we haven't sufficient machine guns to support an infantry attack, and the supply of shells is bad. The commander of our supplies, Commissariat, has promised us 400 shells and 150,000 cartridges as soon as they're brought up. 
but that's when they're brought up, whereas we've got to attack tomorrow, so General Fichelarov has ordered. He proposes that we should allocate a regiment to support the storm detachments. They went into the attack four times yesterday and suffered enormous losses. I must say they fought like devils. Well, and Fichelarov proposes that we should strengthen the right flank and transfer the action to this point here. Do you see? Here the terrain makes it possible to approach within 700 to 1,000 feet of the enemy's lines. And as it happens, his adjutant has only just ridden off. He brought me a new oral instructions to go to General Fitchelarov's staff tomorrow morning at 6 for a conference on the coordination of operations. He and his staff are in Bolshoi Senin Hamlet at present. The task consists in immediately driving the enemy back before his reinforcements arrive from Siribriakova station. On the farther side of the Don, our forces are not displaying very great activity. The 4th Division has crossed the Choper, but the Reds have thrown out strong covering forces and are obstinately holding the roads to the railway. But meantime, they've thrown a pontoon bridge across the Don and are removing equipment and reserves from ust as fast as they can. The Cossacks are saying that the Allies are on the way. Is that true? There's a rumor that several English batteries and tanks are on their way from Chernyshevsky. But this is the question. How are these tanks going to cross the Don? In my opinion, it's only talk in regard to the tanks. That sort of talk has been going around for some time. There was a long silence in the room. Kopilov unbuttoned his brown officer's tunic, rested his puffy, scrubby cheeks on his hands, and long and reflectively chewed a dead cigarette. His wide-set, round, dark eyes were half-closed with weariness. His handsome face was marred by the traces of sleepless nights. At one time, this man had been a teacher in a day church school, but on Sundays he had been the guest of merchants in the district and had played cards for small stakes with the merchants and their wives. He had played the guitar well and had been a gay, sociable young man. Then he had married a young woman teacher, and he would have gone on living in the district center and doubtless would have worked until he retired on a pension. But during the World War, he had been called up for service. After training in a Junkers military college, he had been sent with one of the Cossack regiments to the front. The war did not change his character and appearance at all. There was something inoffensive, fundamentally civilian about his full short figure, his good-natured face, the way he carried his sword, the way he had dressed subordinates. His voice lacked the metallic tone of command characteristic of the soldier. He wore his officer's uniform like a sack. Despite all his three years at the front, he had never acquired a military bearing and trim. All his looks betokened a man who was in the war by accident. He was more like a stout burgher dressed in an officer's uniform than a genuine officer. Yet the Cossacks had great respect for him and listened to what he said at staff conferences. The insurgent command greatly esteemed his sober mind, his easygoing character, and undemonstrative bravery, which he had often proved in battle. Grigor's previous chief of staff had been the illiterate and ignorant ensign Kruzhilin. Kruzhilin had been killed in one of the battles on the Chira, and when Kapilov took over the staff, he carried out his duties intelligently, prudently, and with success. He sat as conscientiously in the staff meetings, planning operations, as he had once sat over the correction of pupils' exercise books. Yet, when required, at Grigor's first word, he left the staff to look after itself, mounted a horse, and, taking over the command of a regiment, led it into battle. At first, Grigor had been a little prejudiced against his new chief of staff, but in the course of a couple of months he came to know him better, and one day, after a battle, told him frankly, I thought pretty poorly of you, Kapilov, but now I see I was wrong. So what I ask you is to overlook it if you can. Kapilov smiled and made no answer, but he was obviously flattered by this decidedly boorish confession. He lacked all desire for fame and possessed no fixed political views, and his attitude to the war was that it was a necessary evil, and he did not expect its speedy end. So now he was not considering how to develop operations for the capture of ust but was recalling his people at home, his native village, and thinking it would be a good idea to gallop home on leave for a month or six weeks. 
Grigor gazed long at Kopilov, then rose to his feet. Well, brothers and Ottomans, let's go to our quarters and sleep. There's no point in sitting here racking our brains over the capture of Ustmiedvidica. The generals will think and decide for us now. We'll ride off to Fitchelaurov tomorrow. Let him teach us intelligence and sense, poor wretch. But this is what I think in regard to the second regiment. We've still got the authority. And I think it would be best to degrade regimental commander Dudaryev, stripping him of his rank and titles. And his ration of porridge, Yermakov interrupted. No, I'm not joking, Grigor went on. We must reduce him this very day to the rank of squadron commander and send Harlampi as commander of the regiment. You go off at once, Yermakov. Take over the regiment and wait for our instructions tomorrow morning. Kapilov will write out the order for Dudaryev's degradation at once. You can take it with you. Dudaryev will never manage a regiment. He's got no sense at all, and I'm afraid he might expose the Cossacks to a fresh blow. You know what infantry fighting is? It's easy enough, then, to risk your men's lives if the commander doesn't know what he's doing. That's true. I'm in favor of degrading Dudaryev. Kapilov supported Grigor. Well, Yermakov, are you against? Grigor asked, noticing a look of dissatisfaction on Yermakov's face. Why, no, I didn't say anything. Can't I even raise my eyebrows now? So much the better. Yermakov is not against. Ryabchikov will take over his mounted regiment for the present. Mikhail Grigorich, write out the order and then get some sleep until dawn comes. And up again at six. We'll go and see this general. I shall take four orderlies with me. Kapilov raised his eyebrows in astonishment. What do you want all them for? For show. After all, we're not nobodies either. We command a division. Grigor laughed and shrugged his shoulders, threw his great coat around his back and went to the door. He lay down under the eaves of a shed, covering himself with a horse cloth, not removing his boots or his great coat. For a long time, the orderlies were noisy in the yard. Somewhere close at hand, horses snorted and chewed measuredly. There was a scent of fresh dung fuel and of earth not yet cool after the heat of the day. Through his drowsiness, Grigor heard the orderly's voices and laughter, and heard one of them, a youngster, judging from his tones, saddle his horse and declare with a sigh, Ah, brothers, I'm fed up. Here it is midnight, and off I've got to ride with a packet. Never any sleep for us, or rest. Oh, stand still, you devil. Your hoof, raise your hoof, I tell you. And a second man, with a muffled, frozen bass voice, said in an undertone, We're fed up with you, soldiering. You've bored us stiff. You've worn out all our good horses. His voice passed into a pleading, hurried patter. Pour us out some baccy for a cigarette. Ah, you're a fine friend. You've forgotten the red army boots I gave you when we were at Belyavin, haven't you, you swine? Others would have remembered me forever because of those boots, but I can't even wheedle backy for a cigarette out of you. The bit clattered and rattled against the horse's teeth. The horse breathed long and deeply and trotted off, its shoes clattering dryly over the stonily hard, dry earth. They were all talking about the same thing. We're fed up with you, soldiering. You've bored us stiff, Grigor mentally repeated, smiling, and he at once fell off to sleep. The moment he dozed off, he had a dream, which he had dreamed many times before. Over the brown fields, over high-standing stubble, lines of Red Army men were moving. The first rank extended as far as the eye could reach. Behind it were six or seven other ranks. The men drew nearer and nearer in the oppressive silence. The little black figures grew, increased in size, and now he could see them coming on at a swift, stumbling stride, on, 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 coming within firing range, running with their rifles at the trail in ear-flapped cloth helmets, with mouths silently gaping. Grigor was lying in a shallow trench, convulsively rattling the lock of his rifle, firing again and again. Under his fire, the Red Army men fell, throwing themselves down headlong. He thrust in a fresh clip of cartridges and, glancing for a second to either side, saw the Cossacks leaping out of the neighboring trenches. They turned and ran, their faces distorted with fear. He could hear the terrible beating of his heart. He shouted, Fire, you swine! Where are you going? Stop! Don't run! 
He shouted at the top of his voice, but his voice was terrifyingly weak, hardly audible. He was seized with horror. He, too, jumped up, and as he stood, he fired a last time at a swarthy elderly Red Army man who was silently running straight towards him. He saw he had missed. The soldier had a tensely serious, fearless face. He ran lightly, his feet hardly touching the ground, his brows knitted, his cap on the back of his head, the edges of his greatcoat tucked up. For one moment, Gregor stared at the approaching enemy, saw his glittering eyes and pale cheeks overgrown with a youthful, curly little beard, saw the short, broad legs of his boots, the little black eye of the slightly depressed rifle barrel, and above it, swinging rhythmically, the point of the dark bayonet. An invincible terror took possession of him. He tugged at the bolt of his rifle, but the bolt would not shift. It had jammed. In despair, he beat the bolt against his knee with no result. But the Red Army man was now only five paces away. Gregor turned and fled. Before him, all the bare brown field was sprinkled with fleeing Cossacks. Behind him, he heard his pursuer breathing heavily, heard the hollow thud of his boots, but he could not run any faster. He had to make a terrible effort to force his feebly bending legs to move faster. At last, he reached a half-ruined, gloomy cemetery, jumped across the fallen fence, ran between the sunken graves, the crooked crosses and little shrines. Yet one more effort and he would be safe. But now the thunder of feet behind him increased, grew louder. The pursuer's burning breath scorched his neck, and at that moment he felt himself seized by the tail and skirt of his greatcoat. A muffled cry burst from him, and he awoke. He was lying on his back. His feet, squeezed in the tight boots, had gone numb. There was a cold sweat on his brow. All his body ached as though he had been thrashed. Oh, hell, he said hoarsely, listening with satisfaction to his own voice, and still unable to believe that what he had just lived through was a dream. Then he turned over on his side, wrapped himself up to his head in his greatcoat, thought, I ought to have let him come close, parried his blow, struck him down with the bayonet, and then run. For a moment he lay reflecting on this dream he had now had several times, experiencing a joyous emotion at the feeling that it was only a bad dream, and that in reality there was no danger near at all. It's extraordinary that in a dream everything's ten times as terrible as in real life. Never in all my life have I known such terror. Even in the tightest corners, he thought as he dozed off and gratefully stretched out his numbed feet. Kapilov aroused him at dawn. Get up! It's time to get ready and go. We were ordered to be there at six. The chief of staff had only just shaved, cleaned his boots, and put on his creased but clean tunic. He had obviously been in a hurry. His puffy cheeks had two razor cuts, but he had a general air of spruce elegance that he had lacked before. Gregor ran his eyes critically over him and thought, Bah, how he's togged himself up. He doesn't want to look anyhow when he presents himself to the general. As though he had followed the course of Gregor's thought, Kopilov said, It's bad to turn up looking slovenly. I advise you to make yourself presentable, too. I'll go as I am, Gregor muttered, stretching himself. You say we were ordered to be there at six, so they're already beginning to send you and me orders. Kapilov laughed and shrugged his shoulders. New times, new manners. As he's senior in rank, we're bound to obey. Fitchilaurov's a general. It's not for him to come to us. You're right. They did come to us, but now we go to them, Gregor said, and went off to the well to wash. The mistress of the house rushed into her hut, brought out a clean, embroidered hand towel, and bobbed as she handed it to him. With the end of the towel, he furiously rubbed at his face, burnt a brick red by the cold water, and said to Kapilov, You're quite right. But the messieurs, the generals, should bear in mind this one thing. The people have changed since the revolution. They've been reborn, as you might say. But the officers still go on measuring with the old measures. I'm afraid their measures are broken now, though. The officers are a little stiff in the joints. They need some axle grease in their brains to stop the creaking. 
What are you getting at? Kapilov abstractedly asked as he blew a speck of dirt from his sleeve. Why, at the fact that they're carrying on just in the same old way. For instance, I've held the rank of officer ever since the German War. I earned it with my blood. But when I'm in the officer's company, I feel just as if I was going out of a hut into the frost in my pants. They give off such a cold feeling towards me that I feel it all down my back. Grigor's eyes glittered furiously, and without knowing it, he raised his voice. Kapilov looked about him, displeased, and whispered, Don't talk so loud. The orderlies will hear. And why is that, you ask? Grigor went on, lowering his voice. Why, it's because to them I'm a white blackbird. They've got hands, but because of my calluses, I've got hoofs. They scrape their feet, but it doesn't matter what I do. I knock into everything. They smell of toilet soap and all sorts of womanish creams and paints, but I smell of horse piss and sweat. They're all educated, but I had difficulty in getting through a church school. I'm foreign to them from my head to my heels. That's why it's all like that. And when I leave them, I always have the feeling that a spider web has settled on my face. I'm ticklish all over and horribly uncomfortable, and all I want is to get clean. He threw the towel down on the well frame and combed his hair with a piece of broken comb. Untouched by sunburn, his forehead showed a brilliant white against his swarthy face. They don't want to understand that all the old has broken to pieces and gone to hell, he went on more quietly. They think we're made of different dough, that an uneducated man, one of the ordinary folk, is some sort of cattle. They think that in military affairs, I, or such as I, understand less than they. But who are the Reds' commanders? Is Budioni an officer? He was a sergeant in pre-war days, but it was he who gave the generals of the staff a good hiding. Is Zloba an officer? But it was through him that the officers' regiments were smashed. Guselschikov is the most famous fighter of all Cossack generals, but he galloped away from Ustkhapyersk in only his pants last winter. And do you know who sent him packing? Some Moscow locksmith a red regimental commander. The prisoners were all talking about him afterwards. You've got to understand that. And how about us uneducated officers? Did we lead the Cossacks so badly during the Rising? Did the generals help us to any extent? They helped quite a lot, Kapilov said significantly. Well, they may have helped Kudinov, but I've gone without their help and beaten the Reds without listening to others' counsels. Well, and what of it? Don't you believe in applying science to military matters? Yes, I do, but that's not the main thing in war, brother. Well, what is, Pantelievich? The cause you're fighting for. Well, that's another thing, Kapilov said, smiling. That goes without saying. In this war, the idea is the main thing. The one who wins is the one who knows what he's fighting for and believes in his cause. That's a truth as old as the world itself, and it's no use your trying to put it forward as a discovery of your own. I'm for the old, for the good old times. If things were going to be different, I wouldn't lift a finger to go anywhere or fight for anything. All those on our side are men who are defending their old privileges, suppressing the revolting people by force of arms. And you and I are among those suppressors. I've been studying you for a long time, Grigor Pantelievich, and I can't understand you. You'll understand later. Let's go, Grigor retorted, and went towards the shed. Desiring to please him, the mistress of the house, who had been watching his every movement, said to Grigor, Would you like a drink of milk? Thank you, mother, but I haven't time to drink milk. I'll have some later. Near a shed, Prokhor Zikov was zealously sipping sour milk from a cup. He did not wink an eye as he watched Grigor untie his horse. He wiped his lips with his sleeve and asked, Going far? And am I coming with you? Grigor boiled over and said with cold fury, You mange! What the hell are you playing at? Don't you know your duty? What's my horse standing bridled for? Who's supposed to bring me my horse, you devil's glutton? You're always chewing and never ending. Now drop that spoon. Where's your discipline, you bottomless pit? And what have you flared up for? Prochor muttered in an injured tone as he made himself comfortable in the saddle. You ball away, but it's all for nothing. You're not so old in the feathers, after all. Can't I have a bite or sup before a journey? What are you shouting about? Because you're enough to drive me mad, you pig's chitterlings. How dare you speak to me like that? 
We're just off to call on a general, so you keep your eyes skinned. You're too used to being familiar with your superiors. Who am I to you? Ride five paces behind, Gregor ordered as he rode out of the gate. Prochor and the three other orderlies fell back, and Gregor, riding beside Kopilov, continued the conversation. He asked in a jesting tone, Well, what is it you don't understand? Perhaps I can explain to you. Not noticing the sneer in the tone of Gregor's voice and the form of his question, Kapilov answered, Why, I don't understand your position in this business, that's what. On the one hand, you're fighting for the old regime, but on the other hand, you're something, excuse me if I put it bluntly, something rather on the lines of a Bolshevik yourself. How am I a Bolshevik? Gregor's face clouded, and he sat up sharply in the saddle. I don't say you are a Bolshevik, but something rather like a Bolshevik. In what way, I ask? We'll take your talk about the officers and their attitude to you. What do you want them to do? And what is it you want at all, for that matter? Kapilov questioned, smiling good-naturedly and playing with his whip. He glanced back at the orderlies who were animatedly discussing something and raised his voice. You're offended because they don't accept you as an equal, because they look down on you. But they're quite right from their point of view. You must realize that. It's true, you're an officer, but it's only by chance that you've reached the rank of officer. Even when you wear an officer's uniform, you're still, forgive me for saying so, a boorish Cossack. You've got no manners. You express yourself badly and coarsely. You lack all the qualities which are natural to an educated man. For instance, instead of using a handkerchief as all cultured people do, you blow your nose on your finger and thumb. When you're eating, you wipe your hands on the leg of your boot or on your hair. After washing, you're not too squeamish to wipe your face on a horse cloth. You either bite your nails short or cut them with the end of your sword, or even better. Last winter in Kargin, I heard you talking to a certain woman of the intelligentsia class, whose husband had been arrested by the Cossacks, and you stood buttoning up your fly in front of her. So it would have been better if I'd left it undone? Gregor asked, smiling morosely. Their horses were striding along side by side, and Gregor took a sidelong look at Kapilov, at his good-natured face, and listened with a touch of chagrin to his words. That's not the point, Kapilov exclaimed, frowning with annoyance. How can you interview a woman at all, when all you're wearing is your trousers and you've got bare feet? You didn't even fling your jacket around your shoulders. I remember that very well. Of course, these are small things, but they sum you up as a man. How shall I put it? Put it as simply as possible. Well, as an extremely boorish sort of man. And the way you speak, it's horrible. Instead of quarters, you say quarters. Instead of evacuation, you say evacuation. For seemingly, you say it looks like as if. And like all illiterate people, you have an inexplicable passion for fine-sounding foreign words. You use them in season and out of season. You twist them unbelievably. And when military terminology is used at staff conferences, such words as dislocation, dispositions, concentrations, and so on, you stare at the speaker in admiration, and I venture to say even with envy. Now you're talking bosh, Gregor exclaimed, and a merry look appeared on his face, stroking his horse between its ears, scratching its silkily warm skin under the mane, he added, Well, carry on, give your commander a good dressing down. Now listen, why should I dress you down? It ought to be quite clear to you yourself that you happen to be unfortunate in regard to these things, and then you get upset because the officers don't treat you as an equal. So far as manners and education are concerned, you're just a blockhead. The insulting term fell out almost by accident, and Kapilov took alarm. He knew how uncontrollable was Gregor's anger, and he was afraid of an outburst. But he took a swift glance at Gregor and at once felt reassured. Throwing himself back in the saddle, Gregor was laughing silently, and a dazzling grin of teeth gleamed under his whiskers. Kapilov was so surprised at this result of his words, and Gregor's laugh was so infectious, that he also burst into laughter, saying, There you are. A sensible man would have wept at such a scolding, but you're neighing away. Aren't you queer? So you call me a blockhead. 
Then damn you, Gregor remarked when he stopped laughing. I don't want to learn your manners and customs. They'll be no use to me when I'm driving bullocks, but God grant if I live so long I shall have to handle bullocks, and it won't do for me to bow and scrape to them and say, Ah, do submit, baldhead. Pardon me, speckle. Permit me to adjust the yoke on you. My dear sir, Mr. Bullock, I most humbly request you not to break down the furrows. You have to talk more curtly to them. Gee up! That's all the bullocks know about dislocation. Not dislocation, but dislocation. Kapilov corrected him. Well, as you wish. But there's one thing I don't agree with you on. What's that? That I'm a blockhead. I may be a blockhead to you, but you wait a bit. Give me time, and I'll go over to the Reds, and with them I shall be heavier than lead. And then you well-mannered and educated parasites had better not fall into my hands. I shall wring out your entrails, and your souls with them, Gregor said, half in jest, half serious. He touched up his horse, putting it into a sharp trot. Over the Donside lands, the morning was coming in such a fine-spun silence that every sound... Even the faintest disturbed it and awoke the echoes. In the steppe only the skylarks and quails were in possession, but in the nearby hamlets that incessant quiet rumbling could be heard, which always accompanies the movement of large military forces. Gun carriage wheels and ammunition wagons clattered in the ruts. Horses were neighing by the wells. The steps of passing companies of Black Sea infantry Cossacks gave off a soft, muffled tramp, Britskas and lines of civilian wagons carrying stores and ammunition up to the front were thundering along. Around the field kitchens hung a pleasant smell of stewing millet, of tinned meat garnished with laurel leaves, and of fresh baked bread. Below ust itself a frequent exchange of rifle fire was going on, and rare cannon shots boomed lazily and hollowly. The battle had just begun. General Fitschalaurov was having breakfast when an elderly, harassed-looking adjutant reported. The commander of the 1st Insurgent Division, Melyakov, and his divisional chief of staff, Kapilov, asked them to my room. With a large, gnarled hand, Fitschalaurov pushed away his plate with a litter of eggshell, unhurriedly drank a glass of fresh milk, and neatly folding his serviette, rose from the table. Of extraordinary height... Agedly massive and puffy, he seemed incredibly large in that tiny Cossack room with its crooked door lintels and dim and small windows, coughing hollowly, adjusting the high collar of his irreproachably fitting uniform as he went. The general passed into the next room, curtly bowed to Kapilov and Gregor as they rose to their feet, and not offering them his hand, beckoned them to the table. Steadying his sword with his hand, Grigor cautiously sat down on the very edge of the stool and glanced sidelong at Kapilov. Fichelaurov heavily lowered himself onto the Viennese chair, making it creak beneath him, bent his shanky legs, laid his great hands on his knees, and said in a thick, low voice, I have invited you here, gentlemen, in order to settle certain questions. The insurgent partisan warfare is finished. Your forces will cease to exist as an independent unit, and for that matter, they never have been a unit in reality. A fiction. They are to be amalgamated with the Dawn Army. We shall pass to a planned offensive. It is time to realize that, and unconditionally to subordinate yourselves to the orders of the higher command. Be so good as to inform me why your infantry regiment did not support the storm battalion's attack yesterday. Why did the regiment refuse to go into the attack, despite my orders? Who is the commander of your so-called division? I am, Grigor answered in a low voice. Be so good as to answer the question, then. I didn't return to the division till yesterday. And where had you been pleased to be before that? I had been home on a visit. A divisional commander is pleased to go home on a visit at a time of military operations. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette.
The Dawn Flows Home to the Sea, Part 2, by Mikhail Sholokhov, continued. A divisional commander is pleased to go home on a visit at a time of military operations. The division's a rabble, sheer arbitrariness, a disgusting state of affairs. The general's bass voice thundered louder and louder in the confined space of the little room. Outside, the adjutants went about on tiptoe, whispering, smiling to one another. Kapilov's cheeks turned whiter and whiter, but as Grigor stared at the general's face, at his swollen, clenched fists, he felt an uncontrollable frenzy awakening in himself also. Fitchalarov jumped up with unexpected agility and, seizing the back of his chair, shouted, It's not military forces you command, but Red Guard rabble. They're not Cossacks. They're the dregs of humanity. You, Mr. Myelyakov, shouldn't be in command of a division. You should be working as an orderly. You ought to be cleaning boots, do you hear? Why wasn't the order obeyed? You weren't holding a meeting, were you? You weren't discussing the order by any chance. Beware. We're not comrades here, and we won't allow the introduction of Bolshevik methods. We won't allow it. I must ask you not to shout at me, Grigor said in a thick voice, and rose, pushing back his stool with his foot. What did you say? Fitchalarov cried hoarsely, panting with agitation, leaning across the table. I must ask you not to shout at me, Grigor repeated in a louder tone. You sent for us in order to decide... He was silent for a second, lowered his eyes, and not removing his gaze from Fitchalarov's hands, dropped his voice almost to a whisper. If you, Your Excellency, attempt to lay even your little finger on me... I shall saber you on the spot. The room grew so quiet that Fitchalarov's gasping breath could be heard distinctly. The silence lasted a good minute. The door creaked a little. A scared adjutant looked through the chink. The door was as cautiously closed. Grigor stood with his hand gripping his saber hilt. Kapilov's knees were trembling. His eyes wandered over the wall. Fitchalarov dropped heavily into his chair, groaned in an aged voice, and barked, A fine business! Then, quite quietly, but not looking at Grigor, Sit down. We got worked up a bit, and now it's past. Now be so good as to listen. I order you immediately to transfer all your mounted forces, but sit down. Do. Grigor sat down, and with his sleeve wiped away the copious sweat which suddenly beaded his face. To proceed, all mounted forces are immediately to be transferred to the southeast sector, and to open an attack at once. On your right flank you will be in contact with the 2nd Battalion of the military commander Chumakov. I shall not take the division there, Grigor said in a weary tone, and groped in his trouser pocket for his handkerchief. With Natalia's lace handkerchief, he once more wiped the sweat from his brow and repeated, I shall not take the division there. And why not? The regrouping of forces will take a lot of time. That's nothing to do with you. I am responsible for the outcome of the operation. But it has to do with me. And you're not the only one who will be responsible. So you refuse to carry out my command? Fitzhilarov asked hoarsely restraining himself with obvious effort. Yes. In that case, be so good as to hand over the command of the division at once. Now, I understand why yesterday's order was not carried out. You can please yourself about that, but I shall not hand over the command of the division. And how am I to understand that? Just as I said, Grigor smiled almost imperceptibly. I dismiss you from your command, Fitchalarov raised his voice, but Grigor at once rose to his feet. I am not subordinate to you, Your Excellency. Then whom are you subordinate to? I am subordinate to the commander of the insurgent forces, Kudinov. It amazes me to hear all this from you. At the moment, at least, you and I are of equal rank. You command a division, and I command a division. And for the time being, you'd better not shout at me. When I'm reduced to the rank of squadron commander, then by all means. But even then... Grigor raised his dirty forefinger and smiling, even while his eyes blazed furiously, he ended, Even then, I'm not going to be shouted at. Fitchalarov rose, adjusted his tight collar, and said with a slight bow, 
There is nothing more for us to discuss. Do as you wish. I shall immediately report your conduct to the Army staff, and I dare to assure you the results will not be slow in revealing themselves. Our field court-martial is at present functioning with the greatest promptitude. Paying no attention to Kapilov's despairing glances, Grigor clapped on his cap and went to the door. At the threshold, he halted and said, You can report to where you like, but you can't frighten me. I'm not a nervous sort. And for the present, you'd better keep your hands off me. He stood thinking a moment and added, For I'm afraid my Cossacks might shake you up a bit. He kicked open the door, and his saber clattering went with a swinging stride into the porch. The agitated Kapilov overtook him on the steps. You're mad, Pantelievich, he whispered, squeezing his hands in despair. The horses, Grigor shouted in a ringing voice, crushing his whip in his hands. Prokhor flew up to the steps like a devil. As Grigor rode out of the gate, he looked back. Three orderlies were fussing around General Fichelarov, helping him to climb into the handsome saddle of his high-standing horse. Grigor and Kapilov rode for nearly a mile in silence. Kapilov held his peace, realizing that Grigor was not inclined for conversation, and that at the moment it would be dangerous to argue with him. At last, Grigor could no longer restrain himself. What are you so silent about? he asked sharply. What did you come with me for, to act as a witness, wanting to make out that you said nothing? Well, brother, but you played a fine game. And didn't he? I grant you he was in the wrong, too. The way he spoke to you was absolutely disgusting. I wouldn't say he spoke to us at all. Right from the start he bawled as though someone had stuck a needle in his arse. All the same, you did a fine thing. In subordination to a senior officer. In field conditions, my friend. That's nothing. The only pity is that he didn't try to attack me. I'd have brought my blade down on his forehead hard enough to splinter his brain box. As it is, you can't expect any good to come from it, Kapilov said discontentedly, and slowed his horse into a walk. By all the signs, it's clear they're going to tighten up discipline, so you had better look out. Snorting, their horses walked side by side, driving off the gadflies with their tails. Grigor humorously ran his eyes over Kapilov and asked, What did you tog yourself up like that for? I suppose you thought he'd give you tea. Would you lead to the table with his own fair hand? Shaved yourself, cleaned your tunic, polished your boots. I saw you spit on your nose rag and clean spots off your knees. Please drop it, Kapilov reddened. And all your labor was in vain, Grigor jeered. Not only was there no tea, but he didn't even offer you his hand. With you present, that wasn't to be expected, Kapilov muttered hurriedly. Screwing up his eyes in amazement and delight, he exclaimed, Look, they're not ours. They're allies. A team of six mules was dragging a British gun towards them along the narrow street. At its side, a British officer was riding on a duck-tailed sorrel horse. The rider on the leading mule was also in British uniform, but he had a Russian officer's cockade in the band of his cap, and he was wearing lieutenant's epaulets. When still several yards away from Grigor, the officer set two fingers to the peak of his cork helmet and, with a movement of his head, requested Grigor to make way. The street was so narrow that it was only possible to pass by edging the saddle horses right up against the stone wall at the side. The muscles quivered in Grigor's cheeks. Clenching his teeth, he rode straight at the officer. The man raised his brows in astonishment and drew a little aside. They passed with difficulty, and even then the Englishman had to lay his right leg in its tight leather legging along his thoroughbred mare's gleaming, beautifully curried croup. One of the artillery team, apparently a Russian officer, angrily looked Grigor up and down. I think you might have drawn aside. Surely you don't have to exhibit your rudeness even here, he remarked. You ride on and shut up, you bitches, Udder, or I'll put you aside, Grigor advised him half aloud. The officer raised himself on his seat, turned and shouted, Gentlemen, hold this rascal! Expressively swinging his whip, Grigor made his way at a walking pace along the lane. The weary, dusty artillery men, all of them young officers without mustaches, gave him unfriendly glances, but not one attempted to restrain him. 
The six-gun battery vanished round a bend, and Kapilov, biting his lips, rode up alongside Grigor. You're playing the fool, Grigor Pantelievich. You're behaving like a little child. Why, have you been attached to me as my teacher? Grigor snapped back. I can understand you're getting angry with Fichelarov, Kapilov said, shrugging his shoulders. But what had that Englishman done to you? Didn't you like his helmet? I didn't quite like it here, close to Ustmidvyaditsa. He could have worn it somewhere else. When two dogs are snapping at each other, a third doesn't interfere, you understand? Aha! Uh -huh. So you're against foreign intervention. But I think when you're seized by the throat, you're glad of any help. Well, you can be glad but I wouldn't let them set foot on our soil. Have you seen the Chinese fighting with the Reds? Well, isn't that just the same? They're foreign help too, you know. That's nothing to do with it. The Chinese volunteered to help the Reds. And do you think these others have been forced to come here? Grigor did not know what to answer, and he rode a long time in silence, tormentedly thinking it over. Then he said with unconcealed chagrin in his voice, You educated people are always like that. You never make any allowances. You're like hairs in the snow. I, brother, feel that your argument isn't sound somewhere, but I don't know how to pin you down. Let's drop the subject. Don't lasso me. I'm already muddled enough without your help. Kapilov offendedly lapsed into silence, and they said no more for the rest of the ride, except that Prokhor, goaded by curiosity, rode up to them and asked, Kriagor Pantelievich, Your Excellency, Tell me, if you will, what is that animal the cadets have got harnessed to the guns? They'd got ears like asses, but the rest of them was a natural horse. I didn't even like looking at the cattle. What the devil are they? Do tell me, for we've made bets on it. For a good five minutes he rode behind them, but got no answer. So he fell back, and when the other orderlies drew level with him, informed them in a whisper, They're riding along without saying a word, brothers, and it's clear they're astonished themselves and don't for the life of them know how such filth found its way into daylight. For the fourth time, the Cossack companies rose from their shallow trenches and under the Reds' murderous machine-gun fire laid down again. From early dawn, the Red Army batteries concealed in the forest on the left bank had been incessantly pounding away at the Cossack positions and the reserves assembled in the ravines. Milkily white, Melting clouds of shrapnel blazed up over the dawnside heights. Before and behind the broken line of Cossack trenches, the bullets sent the brown dust flying. Towards noon, the fight grew fiercer, and the western wind carried the roar of artillery fire far along the dawn. From an insurgent battery's observation post, Grigor watched the course of the battle through field glasses. He could see that, despite their losses, the officers' companies persistently advanced into the attack with a series of short sprints. When the fire intensified, they lay down, digging themselves in, and then with another series of sprints they moved on to a new point. But more to the left, in the direction of the monastery, the insurgent infantry showed no signs of activity at all. Grigor wrote a note for Yarmakov and sent it by a courier. Yermakov rode up in a fury half an hour later. He dismounted by the battery tether post and, breathing heavily, made his way to the trench of the observation post. I can't get the Cossacks to move! They won't move! he shouted, when still some distance off, waving his hands. We've already lost twenty-three men, gone as though they'd never been. Did you see the way the Reds mowed them down with machine guns? The officers are advancing, but you tell me you can't get your men onto their feet? Grigor hissed through his teeth. But you look, every one of their platoons has got a hand machine gun, and they're stuffed with cartridges to their eyebrows, but what have we got? Now, no excuses. Lead them into the advance at once, or we'll have your head off. Yermakov cursed terribly and ran down from the rise. Grigor followed him, resolved to lead the 2nd Infantry Regiment into the attack himself. Close to the flank gun, which was cleverly concealed under branches of hawthorn, he was halted by the battery commander. Just come and admire the British handiwork, Grigor Pantelievich. They're about to open fire on the bridge. Let's go up to the top of the rise. Through field glasses, they could just discern the slender ribbon of the pontoon bridge, which red engineers had thrown across the dawn. 
Wagons were rolling across it in an unbroken stream. Some ten minutes later, the British battery, situated in a hollow beyond a stony ridge, opened fire. With the fourth shell, the bridge was smashed almost in its center. The stream of wagons came to a halt. The Red Army men hurriedly set to work to throw the shattered britskas and dead horses into the river. Four barges, crowded with engineers, set out from the right bank. But as soon as they had succeeded in repairing the broken planking of the bridge, the British battery sent over another packet of shells. One of them blew the approach ramp on the left bank high into the air. The second sent up a green column of water right by the bridge, and the stream of wagons once more came to a halt. But they can put up an accurate fire, the sons of bitches, Gregor's battery commander said in admiration. Now they won't give them a chance to cross till midnight. That bridge isn't going to be left whole for a minute. Without removing his field glasses from his eyes, Gregor asked, But why are your guns silent? You should be supporting your infantry. You can see the red machine gun nests plainly enough. I'd be glad to, but we haven't got one shell left. It's half an hour since I sent over the last one and began to fast. Then what are you stopping here for? Harness up and clear out of the way. I've sent to ask the cadets for shells. They won't let you have any, Gregor said decisively. They have refused us once, but I've asked again. They may be merciful this time. They might let us have a couple of dozen just to smash those machine guns. It's no joke they're killing twenty-three of our men. And how many more will they still bowl over? Look at them stitching away. Gregor turned his gaze to the Cossack trenches. On the nearby slope, the bullets were still kicking up the dry earth. Wherever the line of machine gun fire was laid, a strip of dust arose, as though someone invisible was running a melting gray line over the trenches. Along their entire length, the Cossack trenches seemed to be smoking. The dust hung above them in clouds. Gregor no longer watched the fire of the British battery. For a minute he listened to the incessant thunder of artillery and machine guns, then strode down from the mound and overtook Yamakov. Don't go into the attack until you receive orders from me, he said. We'll never drive them out without artillery support. Didn't I tell you so? Yermakov said reproachfully, seating himself on his fretting horse. Gregor watched as Yermakov fearlessly galloped off under fire and thought anxiously, What the devil has he taken the direct road for? They'll mow him down with a machine gun. He should have dropped into the hollow, ridden along the water course, and made his way round the hill back to his men. At a furious gallop, Yermakov rode to the hollow, plunged into it, and did not appear again on the farther side. So he's realized, now he'll get there, Gregor sighed with relief, and lay down below the rise, unhurriedly rolling a cigarette. He was possessed by a strange indifference. No, he would not lead the Cossacks out under that machine-gun fire. There was no point in it. Let the officers' storm companies make the attack. Let them capture Ustmidvyadice. There, lying under the rise for the first time in his life, he evaded directly taking part in a battle. Not cowardice, not fear of death or of useless losses governed his decision at that moment. Not long before, he had spared neither his own life nor the lives of the Cossacks entrusted to his command. But now it was as though something had snapped. Never before had he realized so clearly all the senselessness of what was going on all around him. It may have been the talk with Kapilov, or the clash with Fitzyalaurov, or perhaps the two incidents together that had provoked the mood which had so unexpectedly taken possession of him. In any case, he was determined not to expose himself any more under fire. He vaguely considered that it was not his job to reconcile the Cossacks with the Bolsheviks. For that matter, he could not himself be reconciled with them but he felt that he could not and would no longer defend all these people who were alien in spirit, who were hostile to him, all these Fitchelarovs who had a profound contempt for him and whom he condemned no less profoundly. And once more he was faced with the old contradictions in all their inexorability. Let them fight. I'll stand and look on. The moment I'm relieved of the division I shall ask to be sent to the rear. I've had enough, he thought and mentally returning to the argument with Kapilov, he caught himself trying to find justification for the Reds. The Chinese march with the Reds with bare hands, 
They joined up with them and risked their lives every day for miserable soldiers' pay. And besides, what's the pay to do with it? What the devil can you buy with it? You can only lose it at cards. So it's not a question of making money, but something else. Yet the Allies are sending officers, tanks, and guns, and they've even sent mules. But afterwards, they'll be demanding a handsome pile of rubles for it all. There's the difference. Yes, we'll argue it all out again this evening. As soon as I get back to the staff, I shall call him aside and say, But there is a difference, Kapilov, and don't try to make a fool of me. But he was not destined to renew the argument. That afternoon, Kapilov rode off to the 4th Regiment, which was being held in reserve, and on the way was killed by a stray bullet. Grigor learned of his death only two days later. Next morning, the 5th Division, commanded by General Fitchelarov, took Ustmirvyedice by storm. Chapter 2 Some three days after Grigor's departure, Mit Kokorshinov turned up in Tatarsk. He was not alone. He was accompanied by two fellow soldiers in his punitive detachment. One of them was an elderly Kalmyk, the second an insignificant little Cossack. Mitka contemptuously called the Kalmyk, Come here! but dignified the Cossack tippler and rascal with the title of Silanti Petrovich. Evidently Mitka had done no small service to the Dawn Army by his activities in the punitive detachment. During the winter he had been raised to the rank of Sergeant Major and then to that of Ensign and he arrived in the village in all the glory of his officer's uniform. It must be deduced that he had lived quite well during the retreat beyond the dawn. His light khaki tunic still fitted tightly across his broad shoulders. Greasy folds of rosy skin lay over his close-standing collar. His blue striped trousers fitted him so closely that they all but split across the buttocks. With all his superficial virtues, Mitka would have been in the Ottoman's lifeguards. He would have lived at the palace and defended the sacred person of his imperial majesty if it had not been for this accursed revolution. But even so, he had no complaint to make of life. He had won his way to officer's rank, and that, not like Grigor Melyakov, by risking his head and indulging in reckless heroics. Service in a punitive detachment called for other qualities. Mitka had enough and to spare of such qualities. Having no great trust in the other Cossacks, he himself settled the accounts of anyone suspected of Bolshevism. He was not too fastidious to deal with deserters with his own hands, wielding a whip or ramrod. And as for cross-examining prisoners, there was no one in the detachment to equal him. And the commander himself shrugged his shoulders and said, Say what you like, gentlemen, but it's impossible to surpass Korshinov. He's not a man, he's a dragon. Mitka was distinguished by one other remarkable quality. When it was not advisable to shoot a prisoner, yet it was thought undesirable to let him go free, the man was sentenced to corporal punishment with the birch, and Mitka was entrusted with the execution of the sentence. He carried out his task so well that after the fiftieth stroke, the condemned man succumbed to a bloody vomit, and after a hundred, the other Cossacks confidently rolled him up in sacking without listening to his heart. Not one man so sentenced had escaped alive from Mitka's hand. He himself had said more than once with a laugh, If trousers and skirts were made of all the reds I've flogged to death, I could clothe all the village of Tatarsk. The cruelty innate in Mitka's nature since childhood not only found fitting application in the punitive detachment, but, with nothing to bridle it, developed extraordinarily. By the very nature of his service, he came into contact with the dregs of the officer class, with drug addicts, with rapists, with pillagers and other scum, and in his hatred for the Reds, he willingly, with all a peasant's assiduity, learned all they could teach him, and had no great difficulty in excelling his teachers. Where a neurasthenic officer, worn out with other men's blood and sufferings, could not go on, Mitka only screwed up his yellow, glittering eyes and carried the task through to the end. When he arrived in the village, carrying himself with great dignity, and hardly deigning to answer the bows of the passing women, he rode at a walking pace towards his home. By the half-burnt, smoke-stained gates he dismounted 
handed the rein to the Kalmyk, and straddling his legs went into the yard. Accompanied by Silanti, he silently walked round the foundations. With the end of his whip he touched a lump of turquoise-colored window glass, which had melted during the fire, and said in a voice hoarse with emotion, They've burnt it down, and it was a wealthy house, the best in the village. One of our own villagers, Mishka Koshevoy, burned it down. He killed my grandfather, too. Well, Silanti Petrovich, I've had the experience of visiting my native hearth and home. Are any of the Koshevoys left behind? Silanti asked excitedly. There should be, but we'll see them later. Now let's ride to our father-in-law. On the road to the Myalyakov's hut, Mitka asked Bagatiryev's daughter-in-law, whom he happened to meet, Has my mother returned from beyond the dawn? I don't think she has yet, Mitri Mironich. Then is Myalyakov at home? The old one? Yes. He's at home. The whole family's at home except Grigor. Pyotr was killed last winter, have you heard? Mitka nodded and put his horse into a trot. He rode along the deserted street, and his yellow cat's eyes, satiated and cold, revealed no trace of his recent agitation. As he rode up to the Myalyakov's yard, he said in a low tone, not addressing himself to either of his companions particularly, That's the way your own native village welcomes you. I've even got to go to relations for dinner. Well, we'll pull up again yet. Pantelyemin Prokofievich was mending a harvesting machine under a shed. Noticing horsemen and recognizing Korshinov among them, he went to the gate. Come in, by all means, he said hospitably, opening the wicket gate. We're glad to have guests. Welcome back. Hello, Father. All alive and well? Glory be. All well so far. But surely you aren't going about in officer's uniform. Why, did you think your sons were the only ones entitled to wear the white epaulets? Mitka said in a self-satisfied tone, giving the old man his long, venous hand. My sons weren't so very anxious to get them, Pantelyemin Prokofievich answered with a smile, and went in front to show the newcomers where to tether their horses. The hospitable Ilinichna gave the guests dinner, and then they turned to conversation. Mitka asked details of his family, and was taciturn, revealing neither anger nor sorrow. He casually asked whether any of Mishka Koshevoy's family was left in the village, and learning that Mishka's mother and her children were still at home, gave Silanti a swift surreptitious wink. The guests soon made ready to go. As he saw them off, Pantelyemin Prokofievich asked, Are you thinking of staying long in the village? Well, yes, two or three days perhaps. Will you be seeing your mother? That depends. And are you going far now? Hmm, just going to see some of the people in the village. We'll be back soon. Before Mitka and his companions had time to return to the Myalyakov's hut, the rumor was spreading through the village that Korshinov had arrived with Kalmyx and had killed all the Koshevoy family. Pantelyemin did not hear the rumor. He went to the smithy and back and was preparing to tackle the harvesting machine again when Ilinichna called him in. Here, Prokofitch, hurry up! A note of undisguised alarm sounded in the old woman's voice, and the astonished Pantelyemin at once made his way to the hut. Natalia was standing, tear-stained and pale, at the stove. With her eyes, Ilinichna indicated Anikushka's wife and asked in a deeply upset tone, have you heard the news, old man? Oh, something's happened to Grigor. God be merciful and protect him. The thought scared Pantelyemin. He turned pale and fearful and furious because nobody spoke, shouted, Spit it out at once, curse you! Well, what's happened? Something to do with Grigor? As though rendered helpless by his shout, he dropped onto the bench and stroked his trembling legs. Dunya was the first to realize that her father was afraid of bad news concerning his son, and she hurriedly said, No, Dad, it's not news of Grigor. Mitka's killed the Kashevoys. What do you mean by killed? The weight fell at once from Pantelyemin's heart, and still not understanding what Dunya had said, he again queried, The Kashevoys? Mitri? Anikushka's wife, who had run to the Myalyakovs with the news, began to stammer out her story. 
I was looking for our calf, old man, and I happened to go past the Kashavoy's hut, and Mitri and two soldiers with him rode up to the yard and went into the hut. I was thinking, the calf won't go farther than the windmill. It was time, the calf. What the devil do I want to hear about your calf for? Pantaljemin broke in angrily. And they went into the hut, the woman went on, sobbing, and I stood and waited, and I heard them start shouting inside, and I could hear the sound of blows. I was terrified to death. I wanted to run, but I'd only just stepped away from the fence when I heard footsteps behind me. I looked back, and there was your Mitri, had thrown a rope around the old woman's neck and was dragging her along the ground, just as though she was a dog, God forgive me. He dragged her to the shed, and she, poor thing, didn't make a sound. She must have been unconscious already. The Kalmyk that was with him sprang up to a crossbeam. As I watched, Mitri threw the end of the rope up to him and shouted, Pull it up and tie it with a knot! Oh, what I suffered then! In my very sight they strangled the poor old woman, and then they jumped on their horses and rode down the street to the administration, I expect. I was afraid to go into the hut, but I saw blood flowing from the porch under the door onto the steps. God grant I never see such horrors again. Fine guests God sent us, Ilinichna said, looking challengingly at her husband. Pantoljemin listened in a state of terrible agitation to the story, and when Anikushka's wife had finished, went out into the porch without saying a word. Mitka and his assistants appeared at the gate soon afterwards. Pantoljemin nimbly limped towards them. Stop, he shouted when still some distance away. Don't bring your horses into this yard. What's the matter, father-in-law? Mitka asked in astonishment. Turn back, Pantoljemin went right up to him, and gazing into Mitka's yellow twinkling eyes, said firmly, Don't be annoyed, cousin, but I don't wish you to stay in my house. You'd better go your ways. Ah, Mitka drawled in an understanding tone and turned pale. So you're driving me away. I don't want you to soil my house, the old man said resolutely, and never put your foot across my threshold again. We Melyakovs have no kinship with executioners, know that. I understand, but you're a little too merciful, cousin, and it seems you don't know what mercy is, seeing that you've begun to execute women and children. Ah, Mitri, it's an unworthy trade you've taken up. Your dead father wouldn't rejoice if he could see you now. You old fool. Would you like me to fondle them? They killed my father. They killed my grandfather. But I'm to exchange Christian kisses with them, am I? You can go to you-know-where. Mitka furiously pulled on the rein and rode his horse out of the wicket gate. Don't swear, Mitri. You're like my own son to me, and there's nothing between you and me. Go in peace. Turning more and more pale, shaking his whip threateningly, Mitka shouted thickly, don't cause me to sin. Don't force me to. I'm sorry for Natalia, otherwise I'd show you, you merciful one. I know you. I see you through and through. I see the sort of spirit you breathe out. You didn't retreat beyond the Donets, did you? You went over to the Reds, didn't you? That's just it. You all ought to be treated like the Koshevoys, you sons of bitches. Come on, boys. Well, you lame hound, don't you fall into my hands. You'll never escape my fist and I shall remember your hospitality to me. I've raised my fist even against such kinsmen. With trembling hands, Pantoljemin shut the wicket gate and bolted it, then limped into the hut. I've driven your brother away, he said to Natalia, not looking at her. She said nothing, although in her heart she agreed with her father-in-law's step. But Ilinichna swiftly crossed herself and said in a happier tone, and glory be, he's gone for good. Forgive me what I'm saying, Natalia, dear, but your Mitka has turned out a real scoundrel. He's found himself a fine job. Look at him. Not serving like other Cossacks in the real forces. He's joined a punitive detachment. And is that the Cossacks' task, to be executioners? To hang old women and to cut down innocent children with their sabers? Are they responsible for Mitka's doings? Why, at that rate, the Reds might have sabred me and you and Mishatka and Polyushka for Grishka's doings. But they didn't. They had mercy. 
No, God forbid, I don't agree with such goings-on. Nor do I defend my brother, mother, was all Natalia said as she wiped away her tears with the end of her handkerchief. Mitka rode out of the village that same day. Rumor said that he rejoined his punitive detachment somewhere near Kargin and went off with it to bring order to the Ukrainian settlements of the Donetsk region, whose population had been accused of helping to suppress the Upper Don Rising. Chapter 3 After Mitka's departure, he was the subject of discussion in the village for a whole week. The majority of the people condemned his arbitrary butchery of the Kushevoy family. The bodies were buried out of communal resources. Attempts were made to sell the little hut, but no purchaser was to be found. On the order of the village Ataman, boards were nailed across the shutters, and for long after the children were afraid to play around that fearful spot, while as they passed the hut, old men and women crossed themselves and prayed for the peace of the murdered one's souls. Then the time arrived for the step haying, and these recent events were forgotten. The village was absorbed as before in work and in rumors of the front. Those of the farmers who had managed to save their working animals groaned and cursed as they supplied wagons and animals for communal services. Almost every day bullocks and horses had to be taken from the fields and sent to the district center. As the old men unharnessed the horses from the mowing machines, they frequently cursed the long drawn out war. But shells, cartridges, reels of barbed wire, foodstuffs had to be carted to the front, and they carted them. But now, as though of evil intent, such fine days had set in that all they wanted was to mow and then to harvest the ripe, unusually luscious grass. Pantelyemon made ready for the mowing and grew furiously angry with Daria. She had driven off with the yoke of bullocks to carry cartridges. She was to have returned from the transshipment point, but a week passed and still there was no news of her. And without the yoke of old, thoroughly reliable bullocks, nothing could be done in the steppe. To tell the truth, he should not have sent Daria. His heart had been filled with foreboding when he had entrusted the bullocks to her, for he knew how fain she was to pass her time merrily, and how negligent she was of the animals. But there was no one else to send. Dunya could not go, for it was no maiden's work to drive with strange Cossacks on a long journey. Natalia had the little children to see to, and surely it wasn't for the old man himself to take those accursed cartridges. But Daria willingly answered the call. She had already driven with the greatest of satisfaction to all kinds of places, to the mill or on some other task connected with the farm, and all simply because she felt far more free outside the house. Every journey brought her amusement and pleasure. She escaped from her mother-in-law's oversight. She could gossip her fill with other women, and, as she said, could strike up a love affair with any dissolute Cossack who happened to glance her way. At home, even after Pyotr's death, the strict Ilinichna allowed her no freedom, as though Daria, who had been false to her husband while he was alive, was bound to be true to him now he was dead. Pantelyemon knew that the bullocks would not be looked after properly, but there was nothing else to be done. He sent his elder daughter-in-law on the journey, but he lived all the ensuing week in the greatest of anxiety and mental unrest. My old bullocks are done for, he thought more than once, waking up in the middle of the night and sighing deeply. Daria returned in the morning of the eleventh day after her departure. Pantelyemon had just come home from the fields. He was mowing together with Anikushka's wife and had left her and Dunya in the steppe to return to the village for water and provisions. The old people and Natalia were having breakfast when the wheels of the Britska rattled with their familiar clatter past the window. Natalia nimbly ran to the window and saw Daria wrapped right to her eyes, leading in the tired, emaciated bullocks. Is it she? the old man asked, choking over a piece of food swallowed too quickly. Yes. I never expected to see the bullocks again. Well, glory be to God. The accursed draggle tail, she's turned up in the yard only because she had to, the old man muttered, crossing himself and belching with satiation. 
Daria unyoked the bullocks and went into the kitchen, laid the folded horse rug on the threshold, and greeted the others. But why so soon, my dear? You could have spent another week on the road, Pantolyemon said in a grumbling tone, looking at Daria from under his brows and not answering her greeting. You should have gone yourself, she snapped, removing her dusty kerchief from her head. Why were you gone so long? Ilinichna joined in the conversation in order to take off the chilliness of the reception. They wouldn't release me, so I couldn't help it. Pantolyemon shook his head distrustfully and asked, They discharged Christonia's wife at the transshipment point, so why didn't they you? Well, they didn't. Daria's eyes glittered angrily, and she added, If you don't believe me, ride and ask the man who was in charge of the wagons. I've got no reason to go and ask about you, but the next time you stay at home. Death is the only thing you can be sent for. Now you're threatening me. Yes, you are. I won't go in any case. Even if you send me, I won't go. Are the bullocks all right? The old man asked more amicably. Yes, nothing's happened to your bullocks, Daria answered reluctantly and looked blacker than night. She's had to part from some lover of hers on the road, and that's why she's so cross, Natalia thought. She always had a feeling of pity and fastidiousness about Daria and her unclean, amorous adventures. After breakfast, Pantolyemon made ready to drive off, but at that moment the village ottoman arrived. I'd say good journey, but wait a minute, Pantolyemon Prokofievich. Don't go off, he said. You haven't come for a wagon again, have you? the old man said, in an exaggeratedly submissive tone, though he was well-nigh choking with fury.